Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you today on this uh, circular talk event on circular bioeconomy, value chains, insight, and uh, best practices. The event is uh, organized by the leadership group on circular bioeconomy and sustainable food system. This circle, the circular talk is also a part of uh, Circular Week 2022 a series of events focused on uh, knowledge building and facilitating civil transition. Uh, the wonderful thing about uh, Circular Week is the diversity of our speakers uh, and the, the, what they bring to the discussion. I sincerely hope you will enjoy that today. Uh, we will probably uh, see other attendees joining us uh, in a few minutes because we this is already uh, only 10 o'clock. The, but let me start already the circular talk and let me start by saying that the bioeconomy sector is, uh, you know, indispensable in the circular transition that uh, that the world economy is in dire need for. And uh, the one thing that really precludes this transition for the moment are those inherited linear value chains. This is why we started this circular talk to talk about how can we modify them, how we how can we come up with uh, different uh, types of value chains, different entities to enter them. And we divided our circular talk in two parts. Firstly, we want to understand uh, the regulatory environment for possible circular change. Uh, potential for regional cooperation, knowledge, knowledge exchange, um, also among bioeconomic clusters. And the second part is about innovation. We investigate best practices, for example, waste of recycling, cascading biomass, um, system design, preserving natural capital. So these are two main, main topics, you know, to how to change the linear value chains that uh, that actually are here with us today in the bioeconomy sector. Um, I'm sure that the speakers are um, in the program are uniquely placed uh, to debate this uh, key teams. I will show you the agenda for today's circular talk. Uh, I won't delve deep into the you know specific aspect of the agenda, but I'm sure that uh, the speakers that uh, we're entertaining you today are very interesting. And let me already uh, start the circular talk. Um, ah, also, I will all um, invite you to the spatial chat to continue the talk after after our presentations are over, after the question and answer session is over. We still want you to engage uh, with us um, and talk about how can we modify and advance circular value chains in the bioeconomic sector. So without further ado, let me set the stage for consecutive uh, presentation by presenting you uh, the current and upcoming regulatory environment for the bioeconomic sector. As you all know, the European Union change, uh, aims to change the model of economy from the linear to circular model. It all started in 2015 with uh, closing the loop, EU, EU action plan for the circular economy. Now it's continued with the European Green Deal. Um, which aims to for the EU to become climate neutral. And it's the main tool to do it is to advance circularity in, in EU's economy. And as you can see, this is probably the easiest way to see how the ambitions of EU evolved throughout uh, recent, uh, the recent decade. This is to see uh, what is the target share of renewable energy in total energy. And this is of course, not directly connected with bioeconomy, but to some extent it is as 60% of renewable energy uh, in the EU come from bioenergy. And you can see that from 22% in 2020, we're aiming to get to 45% in 2030. 
and this is only the plan for from May 2022. So we can really uh, increase in a few years and probably also months. That that uh, taking into account the global um, the the global environment that we are uh, witnessing right now. Uh, Biochemical sector regulations are also changing. The main goal is not to increase the production of, of biomass. It is to increase its quality. For example, here, uh, increase organic and ecologic farming to reduce environmental impact. This is exemplified by uh, the emissions of uh, um, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Here you have uh, the um, a diagram of um, CO2 equivalent emissions in agriculture. And as you can see, it hasn't changed much since the middle of the 1990s. And also, the EU wants to increase resistance to shocks, different shocks like pandemic, like war, which we have experienced throughout the out last two years. And you, as you can see, here is an example of prices of wheat, prices of maize. It increased by more than uh, hundred percent. So, as you can see, we are really prone to shocks in those uh, global value chains in the bioeconomy that we are uh, using right now. How to change this? The key principles are really easy to grasp. I would say this is the hierarchy of resource management and the cascading use of biomass. As you know. The hierarchy of resource management is more um, used for durable goods, but in case of uh, biomass, you can use cascading use of biomass, and this is really uh, direct uh, implementation of the priority. Uh, so the main idea is to use biomass uh, to the highest value possible. Firstly, in pharmaceutical industry, high value chemicals, then food, feed, materials, low value chemicals, energy production at the end, if nothing else is possible. So you use everything you have, you use all the byproducts, you use it to the highest value possible. And in view of those two principles, the biochemical sub subsector and their value chains can no longer be considered in that isolation. So if you can see, here are the material flows from agriculture and from forestry in the EU. And they are all interconnected. I mean, uh, there is uh, feed, food, plant-based food, fibers, uh, biofuel, other byproducts, furniture, uh, post-consumer wood. All of this stuff is interconnected and we cannot, can no longer interpret um, separate part of bioeconomy. We can we, we have to grasp it as a whole. And this is actually something that uh, the regulations in the EU are already taking into account. This interconnectedness of regulation is crucial for understanding the direction bioeconomy is heading. So for example, if you take the Green Deal, you can see that it uh, is built around like a mat matriotical, all this rough and roll one into another. So we can have fit for 55 inside the Green Deal and other directives like uh, renewable energy directive inside fit for 55. And this is all interconnected also because um, if you may think of fit for 55 as something that pertains only to the energy se sector, this is actually wrong because it um, influences also the bioeconomy. For example, renewable energy that I was already talking about, EU emissions trading system, um, all of the other things together. The Green Deal emphasizes the role of emission reduction. It works uh, for this purpose in various areas, including bioeconomy. So the package includes activities in the areas of climate, environment, energy, transport, industry, agriculture, sustainable finance. And uh, for now, the most important initiatives announced 
our fiscal 55, EU taxonomy, circular economy action plan, farm for two fork strategy, biodiversity strategy, and forest strategy. And as you can see, all of these important initiatives are um, influencing not one, but all of the sectors here. So climate, environment, agriculture, etc. Also bioeconomy to grain point. In the future regulatory environment, requirements will expected to increase, as I shown on the first diagram with uh, uh, with renewable energy targets. And they will increase in line with the cascading principle and the priority of pending resources. Um, so what are the six, in my opinion, uh, main directions? This is further raising the requirements for the cascading use of biomass. This is further raising targets for greenhouse gas emission reduction, um, proportion of renewable energy sources. This is self-sufficiency and transition to local value chain. This is you know, directly connected to, to circular value chains and um, the need to get local biomass to use the mass to the greatest uh, value possible. This is protection of the environment, including biodiversity, supporting organic and uh, organic production, especially vegetable production, and uh, tightening reporting, biomass management, as well as related emission. The expected regulation, regulations will affect the bioeconomic value chains. So we will have more interlinked value chains, greater cooperation with entities taking on different roles. We will have local value chains, decreased dependency on critical materials, limit the role of international logistics, uh, improvement in monitoring, and increase the role of reverse logistics, logistics in case of durable bioeconomic products. And this is uh, the um, introduction and the regulatory environment that I would have, I would like to leave you with for consecutive discussion and consecutive presentation. The first of one being Mr. Udo Hemmerling from the European Economic and Social Committee, which will, who will introduce you um, to our work at the stakeholder platform and, um, and its direction. Mr. Hemmerling, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much uh, and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, on behalf of the European Economic Social Committee, um, you may know or not that uh, EEC is very committed to circular economy and, and uh, bioeconomy approach. And so we are very happy to host the uh, EEC, EC, ESCP, uh, the, economic, uh, the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. And uh, with this platform, we really try to support and facilitate the exchange between all this, the, the partners, the holders, the companies, the startups, they are on the way um, to, to, um, to a bioeconomy uh, future. And uh, we have uh, uh, certain um, proposals for you. We uh, run communication channels. Uh, we have a, a big database uh, for uh, uh, best practices for good examples. Uh, I will present two uh, in a few minutes uh, of them. Um, we, we started five years ago and we really uh, were amazed uh, uh, when the Green Deal uh, program of the new commission uh, was launched. Uh, and. Uh, because of the basic question is uh, uh, how to get away from fossil uh, fuels, from fossil energy and from, from fossil carbon. And this is uh, one of the major drivers for the change of the future to bioeconomy. Because if, there, if we step out of, out of the use of uh, fossil carbon, we basically have two sources anymore for carbon use in our economy. One is recycling. So that's a circular question. And one is 
uh, biomass. Uh, so using photosynthesis, um, the energy of photosynthesis to, uh, to collect the carbon uh, from the air and bring it uh, to the use uh, in our economy. And uh, this is the basic point. We see our role here to support this and uh, to bring, uh, well, the innovation, uh, to bring the process of the changeover from fossil carbon cycles to future um, carbon cycles uh, a bit uh, forward. So we have to rethink our value change. We had chains, we have to uh, change them and we have to be speed up a bit in our process. And uh, uh, I guess uh, it's not only uh, the energy crisis now, maybe that speeds up this process, but generally also the CO2 pricing uh, in the uh, European uh, economy that will be induced, uh, introduced in the next years, which uh, pushes us uh, up. Um, when we talk about biomass, when we talk about uh, bioeconomy, it has to be a sustainable way of growing biomass, using biomass, respecting nature. And so we talk about uh, certification schemes, about rules, uh, also rules in international trade. Um, uh, we see now certain new uh, regulations uh, on uh, on deforestation free um, trade and uh, I guess these are all elements uh, to have really the framework um, uh, for the bioeconomy uh, of the future and uh, and we want also to support these initiatives uh, of setting up new uh, value change value chains uh, that are more transparent, that are more regional orientated for local and regional value, uh, that bring also uh, uh, farmers uh, into, into uh, income and uh, into sustainable um, value chains, and uh, that also have to tell a new story to consumers of sustainability and on, and on um, uh, climate neutrality um, economy. So uh, we see really a holistic approach to bring it together. The food area, the fiber area, the energy area to bring it into a complex process. Um, of combined use of biomass and, um, and also bringing uh, extra effects also for nature, for biodiversity, for protection of uh, natural resources. So uh, as uh, EESC, we were very uh, engaged in the bioeconomy strategy uh, we had, have had uh, uh, several uh, opinions on that, and uh, we will um, also push uh, furthermore uh, the, change, the change to that. So finally, about uh, good practices, as I said, um, the colleagues in the platform, they collected about 700 best practices for now, you can see them. In the, in the database. And I can just shortly present two of them, uh, which are a bit representative. And uh, the first of one is the Milano uh, food policy. Uh, it stands for that many cities, big ones and smaller ones and small mun municipalities are going on the way to have their local concepts uh, of getting, I would say, smarter diets, of getting uh, education on happy and good cooking, I would say, uh, and also uh, 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 collecting food, bringing them to food banks, and collecting 
food waste that cannot be eaten anymore and uh, just have a use uh, maybe for a biomethane or for compensation. Um, so, so have a, a nutrient or energy use um, uh, uh, out of it. So uh, I think this is very important to show that, that this is not only a question of central uh, European policy, but connected with local policy on uh, sustainable food systems. Uh, second example is uh, AgriChem Way. And uh, this is an example to bring, to build the bridge between traditional dairy industry and the use uh, of dairy byproducts for fiber industry for chemical, further chemical uses. And so you have a better use of the uh, very value, high value product milk. Uh, and you have a really more sustainable use um, when you bring it uh, in a kind of byproducts uh, process, uh, a kind of biorefinery process for some byproducts. Uh, in this case, it is the uh, lactic acid. And um, this lactic acid can then be turned uh, into uh, value-added bio-based products. Um, for example, uh, use it in uh, bioplastics or in biofertilizers uh, or in other minerals. So I wish you an interesting morning, uh, more learning and uh, talking about bioeconomy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hamerding, for noticing, you know, this holistic approach to bioeconomy and also underlining the role of bioeconomy in circular transition. Uh, now we start uh, the first part, actually, of the two topics that we want to engage uh, today in. And this is um, the potential for regional cooperation, knowledge exchange and among bioeconomic clusters and also innovation. Let me introduce uh, Mr. Armin Winter from Alhemia Nova with his presentation on decentralized nutrient and resource management to feed Europe's bioeconomy. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to everyone from my side. Um, so I try not to share my screen. Give me a sec. So. No, it's it's actually not working. Oh. So I hope you find uh, you see my presentation. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, there was some. Uh, does it not work? So now I think it's working. So, please share, perfect. Um, yeah, so hello from my side, good morning once again. Uh, my name is Armin Winter from Alchemia Nova. Uh, we are a company, a private company, but which uh, is a research company facilitating um, circularity topics um, and projects and also so in, in whole Europe and also in, in Austria and uh, have also some, some work about how we, how we want to contribute to the bioeconomy uh, today and also in the future. Actually, I planned a little bit of another talk uh, about the other project where we started right now, um, which is about the transformation of regions, um, how to, which tools we can present, how to facilitate this transformation, this transformation of the region. But unfortunately, we had some legal issues, and so I can not present this. And so I will um, give you a, a short overview about what we do, uh, the projects, and how we see this uh, circularity, especially the bioeconomy circularity in, in our company. So for this, um, I have to start introduction about the company scope. Then I will talk a little bit about cascading valorization. 
then about our um, about a prototype we have about constructed wetlands, how we can use it and inform in an a circularity and in a bioeconomy way. And this I want to give you then a, a, a nice uh, practice. Um, so from a project, it's a household project about the circularity in, in communities. And also then this transformation about when you're thinking about you have biomass um, and these valorization steps we saw before. So if you have high value products to getting into low value products, how this can look like and then what we have, what challenges we have to, to be aware of it. So let's go into the into the scope. Um, we have three scopes actually we 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 want to we want to focus on. This is the circularity. So our projects are always try to be nature-based in the end. And one very important way to introduce bioeconomy to get it really done is the participatory way. So really this, this you can say, these are the, the three columns we, we try every time to include in our projects and then somehow to give some answers how this could look like. So let's take to the cascading valorization. You see here a little bit, a uh, lot of, of icons in there. So this should somehow also um, illustrate the complexity when we talk about uh, using circular way. And this is also not comprehensive. So we see really uh, based a circularity um, frame um, um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a biomass way in the end. So, Let's take me shortly through you this. So we have the, this agriculture first. So we produce some biomass in the end there. We have primary products here. Here you see we don't have the, the next circularity cycle. So we are now focusing on byproducts. We get out of these out of these production systems and also some organic waste. And then we have there some processing steps. And every time when you think about um, using some organic waste, some biomass waste, you can think of two ways to make a technical procession step where you have different extraction step, steps to get actually to basic chemical building stuff. So you can think a little bit about, so the, the, the nature provides us with this, uh, with the photosynthesis, with some, with some um, synthesis, chemical synthesis. So the building up materials or, or some resources, and we can use them in the end with the, with, the, with the right processes. We can use to separate them in the end to get high chemical values, sugar, protein. So it can be structural sugar or other sugars. And uh, structural sugar would be actually cellulose, hemicellulose, or something like this, lignin. And out of these, basics uh, of these building blocks we can then further go down in the process and 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 put it to use for for materials we need for our, for our daily life you can say so but today you see it's it's very comp comprehensive and uh, a lot of ways to think with energy etc but today i want a little bit to um, focusing on uh, on a, a product or a prototype we have at the company, and these are these constructed wetlands, also green walls, but but we will focus on this type where we use actually wastewater. Wastewater can be contaminated, salty, etc., and then clean it with 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 actually with the help from nature. So really with 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 certain plants in 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 in, in, in cereal. Um, construction and then how we can then use actually such biomass in the end to get back to our base uh, to our to our building blocks and then use them further into the into valorization. So let's start with the constructed wetlands. You see a nice picture um, how this looks like. So you have the different trays uh, with different plants inside and the the Wastewater. This is now. These are now some some examples from our office. In the end, there we have it. Also, some prototype that we use the wastewater, but into the trays, and then uh, get get cleaned by the plants, and then you can use it then for, for different application into your household again. So there you see how the how the um, um, how the, the cleaning works, and these are actually some some values um, referred from from regulations. What you have to keep in mind to have a really clean water. So, like I said, this is a, a, a 
it brings resource in the end, it brings biomass, but also the, so the main purpose of this is, is the water recovery, the water cleaning, bioremediation, so from carbons, heavy metal salts. And um, this we have now in, in some projects uh, as, as, as a prototype in use. Um, you see here a different sort a little bit. So um, you see how ambulant this, this growing can be. This is the loop. This is actually also like we saw before, um, cleaning, uh, cleaning wastewater. And this is in, in a station in Vienna. And it's, it's a urinal. You can really see nicely how, how it works in the end. So then let me bring the first to the household demonstration project. So, and there is specify on the Cambium here in Austria, in, in Styria. This is a self-sustaining community. They're living in an old military barrack. They um, established it some years ago, seven, eight years ago, and these are 80 people. And there we have a project with them to really bring this biomass circularity to the community. And so this will I show you the next slide. So we have their treatment for the bio waste. We have the small biogas bag. They can produce 0 0.6 cubic meter per day. It's not much, so it's like about three hours of one cooking stove you can you can use with the residual waste they have in the kitchens everywhere. And also then the, the solid fraction we can then use as liquid fertilizer and digestate. The next thing is the green clipping. So they produce everything themselves on, on, on they have a big area to do that. And there we introduce this compost heater. So this is actually very nice um, with a life expectancy from 12 to 24 months. And there you can produce um, heat in the end. So about four months, 70 degrees, and then it goes down until then the microorganism, everything um, um, digests and, and transforms into humus. But you can use this really and build every, every year a new one to make then heating. Then in the end for the winter garden, there's an extra winter garden where we, where we produce agricultural products, salads, cucumbers, et cetera, to, um, for, for the food production. And the third thing is, this is what I was introducing before. This was this cleaning and the, the wastewater. This is the domestic wastewater from community. There we have then to separate the solid fraction from the liquid fraction. And there you see as well, there we have this sludge treatment wetlands, so to really get uh, the, the sludge treated and cleaned. And also this wet eco I showed you before to for water cleaning the different plants, uh, additional ozonization. And then we have clean water to reuse again and put it again uh, back to the production. And so we have a really nice, nice, nice uh, circle to close uh, this project. So, but now we have, uh, I told you about, we, we produce as well uh, biomass um, um, with these wetlands. And there I show you at, uh, another project. We, we do it with the, with the University of Life Science in Vienna, Institute of Chemical and Renewable Materials. And this is about uh, also a macrophyte, so it's typical for wetland. This is now a special macrophyte uh, submersed one, uh, which is growing in the old Danube in Vienna. And this has some special characteristics, this biomass. So you have a very low solid content of 10 weight percent. And this comes into challenges. And we, we heard before, okay, we have to think about local biomass and how to transform this local biomass. And this is really, when you talk about like this one, you have a transport issue. So you transport mainly water in this end. You have an issue for silage. Silage is to um, keep, the, keep the material storageable. So to, to make it storage for, for a long, uh, long um, time because of the whole uh, of the big water content. Also utilization is biogas substrate. And like this kind, like we like I introduced it before in the wetlands, where we put extra plants who should um, and take up uh, like heavy metal, something like this, you have it then in the plant in the end. And then you have to think about uh, how I can use this biomass in the end again. And so when we look about biomass, uh, in the end, you can you can um, distinguish into into different forms, like this fiber we heard before. So these are structural sugars everywhere to find, and they're extractives and proteins. And so, and in this specific case, 
we haven't uh, as a valorization route for food or energy. So really to think about using in a material way. And uh, there we saw a, a similar slide before. Um, you have their fractionation complexes, complexity, I call it. So there are some processes they're easy to do, don't need a lot of energy, then you get some, some, some fractions out of it. And uh, using other things like proteins or, or extractives, it gives you a higher product value, but you always have to think about the downstream processing. Is it worse? Can we do it? How much energy will cost in the way? And this is actually what this whole topic or what is so project is aiming to look for processing low, low, low um, technology processes to really get easy a lot of um, extractives and, and, and different products out of it. So like for proteins, it's, you can make um, adhesives out of it. And the extractives, especially in this case, for this water plant, it's an antioxidant and also antimicrobial. You can, you can prove it and put this out, put it into materials or other stuff again, would, definitely increase the high value from it and also make it a worthwhile for, for bioeconomy to think more in these ways to really look at the, at, the, at the single constituents of the plant. And there we have some prototypes as well I wanted to show you. And there we also have to think about uh, what do you do in the end. So when we take the fiber out of, of some plants, especially in, in these plants, you, it's, they have the structural sugar in it not really the fibers that you have then to, to think about the material way, how to valorize it. But there we can prove that we can make such paper out of it and rigid materials out of it. Also some composites. This is really nice that this is from a watch, uh, a wristband from the watch. You can really make nice of it. And also to think about uh, furniture application. And this will, and the product lifetime is also every time important when we think about using our, our biomass because this also is that some CO2 storage in the end when it's not used everywhere with this, 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 this product, which be thrown away very fast in the end. So then the take home I want to make is really to point out these three columns we have to think about. So. By a circular bioeconomy about this nature-based solution, participatory is very important that you have communities who, who, who are engaged in this project and the, the circular thinking also when we have biomasses to, to think about the downstream processes and the challenges are arising to, to extract the, the, the simple fraction. And so tomorrow use of farmers will look very different from yesterday's presentation and both business leaders and policy makers uh, will need to adjust. I think this is a very good sentence to close my talk. And then I thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't too long. And yeah, I'm then open for questions, looking forward to it. Thank you very much for your presentation and for real world examples, innovative examples of how to use biomass in a cascading manner, also for the good of uh, circular value chains. Now I would like to welcome uh, Mrs. Suzanne Rivera for, from Cooperativas Agroalimentarias de España, who will talk about the cooperation of bioeconomic clusters. Hello. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can so. see you and hear you well. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation. Could you see now? Yes. But in, in presentation mode or? Yes, everything is all right. We can see your presentation. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, um, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Susana Rivera from Cooperativas Agroalimentarias de España, which is the entity that coordinates the Cupid project. In, firstly, I want to, to give you Thank you for inviting us to present Cupid Projects. Um, Cooperativas Agroalimentarias de España is a business association of 3,000 3, cooperatives owned by around 1 million, for, of, million of farmers. Um, this cooperative has spread by all over Spain and are acting, active in most of the agri-food sector, both in production, but also in industrial processing. Um, we belong to COYECA, which is the organization that has brought us today 
uh, and we thank them for the invitation also. Uh, our project uh, is Cupid. Cupid is cooperation of bioeconomy cluster for bio-based knowledge transfer via innovative um, techniques, simulation techniques in the primary production, production sector. Uh, and in this framework of this, of this uh, interesting talk today, we will try to show Cupid as a formula that allow, allows us or is allowing us to advance in the European primary sector in the transition towards a sustainable bioeconomy. Well, just to start, um, we would like to emphasize in the in the objectives of this of this uh, project because uh, in fact the objective is the mobilization of primary producers because uh, they need stimulation to, to adopt this kind of, of business model, sustainable business models. And uh, we would like to, to also to increase the, the, its competitivity, competitive in this, this, in this field. Um, with this objective, we, we have three key important concepts in the project. We, have, we are working with this concept. The first uh, concept is the, the Cupid Bioeconomy Clusters. These bioeconomy clusters that, that are networks that have been set in, in 10 countries around Europe to work in bioeconomy, uh, gathering some interesting, interesting stakeholders from the academia, but also for the, uh, for the policy making and also for the, the primary production sector. Because as, as you, uh, we have uh, the opportunity, uh, we have had the opportunity of of listen to the previous uh, speakers. We 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 are now involved in, in a, an important challenge, and we need all we need, of course, the um, participatory approach. In this sense, within within these clusters. Um, they have select business models, the interesting business model in, in bio-based uh, chains, uh, like as success stories that have been shown to, to uh, some people, some representatives for primary production sector that we have called ambassadors. And these ambassadors uh, have been, are being in charge of spreading this knowledge uh, through other primary producers and uh, inspiring them to adopt this kind of business models in, in the framework of bioeconomy. Well, um, this, this uh, approach with the, the th there is th three key concepts. It, it's being done through an innovative uh, transfer knowledge strategy, including an interesting uh, stakeholder, but also including some interesting uh, success stories. Uh, so, in, in 10 minutes, it's difficult to, to show you the, the, the 11 showcases that we have visited uh, in, in the frame of the project, but I would like to, to, show, the, to show you the, these slides um, just to, to see the, the interesting opportunities for the primary production sector that we have, we have been visiting uh, all over Europe including from uh, different sectors, from agricultural sector, but also for livestock sector, and um, but also relevant initiatives around the bioeconomy have been shown in relation to the production of bioenergy, sometimes, sometimes for self-consumption, by fertilizers, high added value products for co cosmetics, but also pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals, etc. and for 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 building and, and for for even even some of the cases around the production of plant-based food, like uh, one of them, which is focusing on hemp production, using hemp flour for for and enrich uh, plant-based food, and a lot of interesting initiatives, and even some of them uh, working in the uh, capture of CO two from their processes from reuse by other agri food industries uh, also. So um, as you can see, uh, all of them are working are showing us their circular their uh, circular value chains, uh, showing that it's possible. It's possible working in bioeconomy, and it's possible working together in terms of uh, valorization, their, their waste, their residues, uh, closing the loop. Um, all of them show us the, the circular value change, emphasizing in the, in, the, um, in the valorization of all the outputs of their processes, 
you you have a lot of information and in the website of the of the of this of this project and including infographics videos and also some interesting presentations and um just to 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 close this this interesting uh, panel of, of success stories we have identified the uh, common successful factors uh, to from these uh, success stories to show to the primary producers the um, the, the possibility of uh, working together in front of this uh, challenge in that sense we have identified in the in the last month the eight interesting factors to take to bear in mind uh, when the when we are facing the moment of uh, introducing us in the bioeconomy world for the primary producers. In that sense, the first uh, one is the, that uh, all of these showcases are working in increase the value the value of the, the products uh, and waste streams. Um, they are working in, in an optimized way to valorize these, these waste streams and all of them are tending to work in the zero waste uh, way. The second one identified factor is the competence in innovation. So uh, we are sure we, we have proof with this, this uh, success stories that uh, the competence in innovations uh, could be embedded in, in the farm and or the company, but also uh, we can cap this competence through the collaboration with other stakeholders. Um, of course, to develop to develop and, and implement this kind of solutions, uh, we are going to require a lot of professional curiosity, willingness, willingness to take risks, and of course, um, ability to realize when external expertise is needed. So we have uh, the necessity of compound uh, a, a, a competitive uh, team to to carry out this kind of business model. Um, the third one is application of, of new the need application of innovative technologies since we, since we are uh, dealing with uh, closing the loop in these business models we are going to need to 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 spring this this kind of of, of by products in terms to to be able to go to the final step in the in the performance of taking value of this by product. So we are going to need um, innovative technologies. In that sense, these success stories are, are working and are using innovative technologies, for example, in the using high-tech biorefining technologies in their processes. Uh, the fourth one is the, the, the need, of course, of, of access to, to, to capital for required investment. In, in that sense, um, uh, uh, we 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 have proof. We have the 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 information of this success story that, that they are working with to support uh, some of them with a lot of uh, public public uh, support, like a regional strong regional initiatives, like one initiative in France, uh, which is um, which is focusing on revitalizing a, a local area in in a in a France region and. Uh, we are very supported by the local local uh, funds, but also we have proof that um, companies owned by cooperatives could have uh, could been able to uh, raise capital among uh, its own members because in fact cooperatives working for us uh, working for asking for solution for their members uh, we can uh, opt for. Uh, using their their funds, um, the the fifth one is the the, the is the is the focusing the cooperation as we 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 heard before we need cooperation we need participatory approach to 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 being involved in this kind of initiative because uh, as 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 the cooperative model is very well suited to provide governance framework uh, for extensive social but also economic and environmental uh, approach to this to this kind of business model um, but also have the the possibility of reinforce the the mental and economic uh, um, 
perspective to develop new technologies uh, through research and innovation. The sixth one is the renewable energy as the core of this success story because all of them are working in renewable energy and even in self-consumption, taking advantage of these, of these bioproducts. Um, all of the showcases are involved in, in, in uh, gathering the, the, um, the feedstock from primary production, but also uh, also having the uh, primary production uh, sector as a customer to uh, use the the final stage of the of the, of the loop for example in terms of biofertilizers to be used in the in the agricultural fields so they will gather the primary the the, the, the raw material from primary production but they are using the primary production as customers to use the biofertilizers as the result of their business model and the, the last one is uh, uh, about the, the new ways of cooperation in the value chains. So the new cooperation is um, a result of the transition from a, for, from a linear value chain to a cir circular bioeconomy system. So we should work in a circular way uh, with uh, several stakeholders uh, working together from different points of, of view for different uh, expertise and um, uh, in a coordinate in a coordinate coordinative way uh, working together uh, from academia but also for private companies but also for representative for the public sectors in the triple helix uh, uh, model of innovation and just to conclude um, after this uh, assessment, after the assessment, when we prepared the proposal, we were convinced that um, the adoption of innovative um, bio-based business models is highly limited because uh, uh, we are lack of knowledge in this kind of business model and this kind of initiatives. Uh, the integration of primary product, products producers into the economy uh, can be achieved through this kind of tendencies because uh, uh, from from the beginning to now, uh, around 150 ambassadors have uh, have had the opportunity of visiting this success story, learning firsthand from these uh, business models. Um, the replication of the business model could be a good approach and, of course, cooperations and knowledge transfer are close, crucial to uh, be in front of the challenge that we are facing today. So, by, by economy, I start on the fields. That's the key and that is the conclusion of, the, of this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susanna. It was really nice to hear that uh, the cooperation uh, brings so many new uh, benefits uh, to bioeconomy, to bioeconomic production. Also, uh, to showcase that the increased value by products and waste streams can actually make bioeconomy, circular bioeconomy, not only ecological, but also economically viable. So thank you for, for that. Um, I hope we have uh, more time to discuss it uh, afterwards, after the circular talk and in the question and answer session. And now it's time for Maite Aldaya and Jose Miguel Gonzalez, Gonzalez uh, Peñalver from the Institute for Innovation and Sustainable Food Chain Development, Universidad Pública de Navarra, with uh, water footprint and carbon footprint of the Food Bank of Navarra presentation. Hi, good morning. I cannot share the video. I don't know why. Anyway, I will share my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Yes. Ah, now. Yeah. Thank you very much. So thanks for the for the introduction. I will be presenting the carbon footprint of the activities of the Food Bank of Navarra, which was developed together with the Food Bank of, of Navarra. Well, in the presentation, I will summarize the main results of a longer report of more than 50 pages, which is available at the website of the Food Bank of Navarra that you can see at the bottom of this, of this slide, you have the link. Well, the aim of this study was to promote the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions using the car carbon footprint indicator and show the environmental benefits associated with reducing food waste. 
In the first part, we will review very quickly the context concepts and methodology. Second, we will have a look at the main results of the carbon footprint of the activities of the food bank. Then we will analyze the greenhouse gas emissions in a hypothetical scenario without the existence of the food bank, which are the emissions associated with food waste management and additional food production. But perhaps the most interesting part of the study is the comparison of the scenario of the emissions with and without the existence of the food bank, which shows the benefits of reducing food waste in terms of saving greenhouse gases. Well, let's have a quick look at the context. Uh, currently, as we all know, uh, about one third of the food produced for human consumption is lost or wasted. In this context, the Food Bank of Navarra is a foundation with more than 25 years of experience that plays a key role in the rescue of food that would otherwise be wasted, as well as in the intermediation so that the food reaches the most disadvantaged people free of charge. As regards the concepts and methodology, we use the carbon footprint of an organization to measure the total greenhouse gas emission, caused directly and indirectly by the food bank. The emissions are expressed in tons of CO2 equivalent. As we all know, there are different greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, etc. But the CO2 is the greenhouse gas with the greatest influence on global warming. That is why we measure the greenhouse gas emissions uh, relative to this, to this gas. As regards the methodology, we follow the guidelines of the Spanish government as well as international standards. We applied a very simple equation to obtain the emission estimate by multiplying the activity data by the emission factor of the, of the activity. The activity data is the data on the magnitude of a human activity resulting in, in emissions, such as, for instance, kilowatts uh, hour for electricity. A focal point at the food bank provided the activity data, including the consumption invoices, etc. The emission factor is a coefficient that quantifies the emissions of a gas per unit of activity. That is the intensity of the, of the emissions. It, data were obtained from secondary databases. A comparison is made of a scenario with the Food Bank of Navarra and a scenario without the Food Bank of Navarra. In the scenario with the existence of the Food Bank, we accounted for the emissions related to transport of food and volunteers, electricity, gas boilers, and other goods and services such as the water service, cardboard, or wooden pallets. In the scenario without the existence of the Food Bank, the food that is generally rescued by the food bank, that is the food that is poorly packaged or close to the expiration date, will go to waste. This scenario will entail two components. First, this food waste will be disposed in landfills or treated for reuse or recycling, processes that will generate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Second, an additional food product production would be needed to produce the food that in this scenario is wasted, which will release emissions as well. The annual carbon balance of the food bank is estimated as the emissions generated by the food bank minus the emissions that would be avoided by the use of food that would otherwise be wasted. But let's have a look at the main results of the carbon footprint of the activities of the food bank of Navarra. The total emissions of the food bank in the year 2018 were 147 tons of CO2 equivalent and in 2019, 148 tons of CO2 equivalent. These figures are similar to the emissions produced by a round trip flight from Madrid to New York. So you can see that the emissions of the food bank are not so high. As you can see, um, this graph um, represents a summary of the greenhouse gas emissions related to the activities of the food bank by category. The logistics, that is the transport of goods, transport of people and the consumption of goods and services is the main greenhouse gas emitter, which is around 82% of the total, total emissions. As regards the emissions in a hypothetical scenario without the existence of the food bank, there are two elements that we have seen, the emissions associated with the additional food production and the emissions related to waste management activities. We will have a look at both results. The greenhouse gas emissions related to the production of food will amount to 4,272 and 3,914 tons of CO2 equivalent in the two analyzed years. These numbers are much higher than the carbon footprint 
of the food bank that we have just seen, which was 147 and 148. The emissions, as you can see, are a bit higher in the year 2018 because of the quantity of the food managed, which was higher, about 334 more tons were managed in 2018. As regards the kind of food, the largest emissions were associated to the dairy products, more than 20% of the emissions. This is because of the large number of dairy products managed by the food bank, particularly yogurts. And also the dairy products uh, have large emission factors. Afterwards, we have the emissions of vegetables and legumes, prepared meals, fruits, etc. The emissions associated to waste management would have been 443 and 390 tons of CO2 equivalent in the two years. Again, the emissions were higher in 2018 because the quantity of food managed was larger this year. The emissions were analyzed for the different waste management systems for the region of Pamplona in green, the rest of Navarra in, in yellow, and the rest of Spain in blue. From the different treatments analyzed, the landfill will represent about 85% of the total emissions generated by waste management. This is because in the landfill and aerobic conditions, the methane gas is produced, which is a strong greenhouse gas. The rest of the treatments produce less greenhouse gases. For instance, a composting will account for 7% of the emissions, biomethanization 5%, paper and cardboard treatment 2%, light packaging treatment 1%, and glass treatment 0.1% of the, of the emissions. Finally, let's have a look at the annual carbon balance of the, of the food bank. The greenhouse gas emissions generated by the activities of the Food Bank of Navarra, as we have seen, were notably lower than those in a potential scenario without the existence of the Food Bank. Consequently, the activity of the Food Bank of Navarra prevented the emissions of 4,568 tons of CO2 equivalent in 2018 and 4,157 tons of CO2 equivalent in 2019, contributing to climate change mitigation in line with the climate change processes and initiatives at the regional, national and, and international level. In here we have a summary of the numbers that we have just seen, just to mention that these results uh, highlight the importance, not only social, but also environmental, of the Food Bank of Navarra, since it prevents a large amount of greenhouse gases from being emitted into the atmosphere. And thank you very much. I leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Jose Miguel now. Okay, good morning to all of you. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. You can see it. Yeah. Do you see it? Oh. Yes, you see it. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, as my colleague has presented, I am Josemi, and I'm going to explain you the study with a very similar approach to that of MITE, of the carbon footprint, but focusing on the water resources. Science MITE have already introduced you to the context and the organization that we are going to talk about. I will go directly to the water footprint concept following a similar assessment to that of MIT. We are focusing in the evaluation of the water footprint of the Food Bank of Navarra and what will happen without it. We follow with the water footprint assessment manual and we are having an approach of uh, organization evaluation. The unit that we used was cubic meters of fresh water and we divided the measurements in green water, blue water and gray water depending on the source of the water use or contamination. Here are the results of the evaluation of the activities of the Food Bank of Navarra in 2018. This is the first scenario and the footprint with the largest effect in the indirect water footprint uh, was the indirect water footprint with an amount of 1.9 thousand cubic meters. Most of it came from rainwater needed for paper and cardboard production, followed by the energy consumed that is shown there. 
since the water used by the citizens in this region returns entirely to its source, the direct water uh, consumed by the food bank was considered zero. Uh, in the scenario without the food bank, we consider the same source of impact as Maite. On the one hand, the additional food production that will be needed for the beneficiaries of the food bank to be fit. And on the other hand, the waste management uh, that will be necessary to handle the waste of food. As can be seen in the results, the main sources of impact uh, are in the water footprint of additional food products, being 99% of it, and is mostly composed by green water, rainfall water. The remaining 1% belong to the waste management, amounting for 40,000 cubic meters of fresh water. The green part came from uh, landfill leaching, and the blue part came mostly from uh, paper recycling. Uh, after carrying out the comparative analysis of this two scenario, we obtained a very clear result. On the one hand, the food bank activities used almost 2,000 cubic meters of fresh water in 2018. However, in the absence of the food bank, more than 3.2 million cubic meters of water will be wasted. Therefore, with its activity, the food bank prevented the waste of 3.2 million cubic meters of perfectly consumable water fresh water. We can say that the water use avoided by the redistribution of food uh, that will otherwise be waste is 997,000 times greater than the water use by the activities uh, of the food bank in the same period. Can be said that the activities of the food bank prevented the use of 974 Olympic swimming pools of fresh water in 2018. I hope I have been clear. I am being very quickly and brief, but well, I hope you like the presentation. Um, have a nice day. Thank you very much for your presentation, both of you. And thank you for showing us that uh, the effects of uh, you know, the food bank and, and its activities could bring such huge environmental effects. And uh, now it's time for Kiskitsa Insalki from the Institute for Innovation and Sustainable Food Chain Development. Universitat Publica de Navarra to uh, present us uh, uh, the Beef Plus project, Healthy Meat Through Circular Economy. So, hi, good morning. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, uh, but not full screen. And now? Yes, everything. Okay, wrong. okay. So good morning and thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to present our research. Uh, the project we are working in is entitled Beef Plus, Beef Circularity through Vegetable Byproduct Feeding Strategies and is carried out by the company Trasa, uh, the Public University of Navarra, and also with the collaboration of the Public University of the Basque Country and uh, Naked Technalia. <clears throat> uh, the project, uh, this project intends to respond to the needs of the meat sector, especially the PGI Ternera de Navarra, which is a sector that in recent years has uh, been affected by a considerable drop in consumption. Uh, in addition, under the current economic situation, the farmers are facing a high cost of production, uh, being the feed uh, of animals, the highest percentage of that cost in the animal production activity. In order to improve feeding options and therefore the main operating cost in the animal production activity, uh, here we propose to include the vegetable waste products generated in the agri-food industry of Navarra in the rations or diets of fattening calves as a raw material. Uh, besides, these are materials that are generated in large amounts, uh, up to uh, 120,000 to 150,000 uh, tons per year by the Navarra agri-food industry, which, which means a real management problem due to the volume that it represents and also to the few recovery options that are available at the moment. Uh, the project pretends to demonstrate a double improvement related to the healthy properties presented by vegetable byproducts uh, when they are used in fattening feedlots. Uh, the first directly associated with nutrition itself and the second on benefits for animal welfare. In this context, 
Uh, the project is firmly linked to the consumer concern about the impact of animal production. Uh, therefore, there is a real need to achieve a sustainability improvement in the processes, in animal feeding processes. These objectives uh, go together with the need to optimize available resources, reduce the water footprint and the carbon footprint uh, of the processes, and as well uh, the methane emissions in, into the atmosphere. In short, by demonstrating this research line, the Beef Plus project hopes to provide greater added value uh, to the process and also to the product, to the meat, uh, in search of healthy properties in the meat, uh, which represents a responsible, profitable, and a sustainable cycle, improving the level of customer satisfaction and the image of the sector, and thus, in the end, helping the, to promote the consumption of beef. <clears throat> the main uh, bottleneck that this innovation uh, had uh, for us was the absence of standard uh, nutritional values of most of the byproducts in order to calculate a balanced uh, diet or ratio for the animals. Thus, one of the tasks that we have addressed has been the characterization of the ruminal fermentation and in vitro digestibility of these raw materials as well as their nutritional value. And uh, based on the obtained uh, results, a vegetable byproduct diet uh, was fabricated. And then this diet was tested uh, versus a conventional diet that was based on uh, corn, barley, soja, and straw. Uh, at this stage, an experimental trial was carried out on a commercial farm and productive indexes were recorded. At the same time, the production of meat and, uh, and animal welfare were also evaluated in the farm. Uh, when the animals reached a minimum, uh, maximum sorry, of 13 months, uh, as is, it is established by the PGI label, they were slaughtered and the quality of the carcass and the meat uh, was assessed by different uh, analytical means, uh, both uh, instrumental and sensory analytical means. Uh, in order, to test the impact <clears throat> of this production system at the moment. Uh, at this moment, we are also studying the carbon and water footprint of the process, uh, as well as the life cycle of the process. Thus, uh, summarizing, the project foresees different benefits from feed to food. Uh, from an animal feeding standpoint, the formulation and validation of a complete ration called micro silage. Uh, for beef feedlots uh, has been achieved and fabricated. Regarding livestock farms, uh, we have analyzed the benefits of this diet on animal welfare and environmental impact compared to a traditional diet. At the moment, uh, we have finished all the farm trials and we are analyzing the product in order to test the impact of the diet on the quality and nutritional value profile of the obtained meat. Finally, uh, this project could have an impact on uh, the following aspects. Uh, technical information on the nutritive value of new materials that could be used for animal feeding, uh, circularity of the agri-food industry by products, and also economic benefits for livestock by reducing their external dependency on feeding materials. Uh, besides, this obtained knowledge could be applied in other countries and also in different beef um, and small ruminant systems uh, uh, all over the, the Europe and other countries. Uh, so thank you for your attention and uh, sorry for the mistake. In the, um, there was a technical problem and my dear Leia has spoken with my, under my name and now she's, or she's correctly identified. And uh, she will be here in the chat uh, to answer the questions because she's also involved in the in the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very interesting presentation on um, on beef, one of the byproduct, well, one of the uh, biomass that can be used effectively and circularly in in a circular fashion. And now we will have a presentation from. Laia Yanas Argelaguet from um, Beta Technological Center, University of Vic, Central University of Catalonia, with the project of 30 manual. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my presentation? 
Yes, we can. Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. And first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation to, to present um, today here the, the first, well, a brief overview of uh, what we are doing in in Fertimanure project. So Fertimanure is an Horizon 2020 project that started um, yeah, almost uh, three years ago in uh, January 2020. We are uh, 20 partners from different uh, disciplines, let's say, so we are a um, multi-actor uh, consortium, including uh, universities, but also farmers, um, uh, biz, uh, policy makers, technology providers, the fertilizing industry, so in order to have uh, more impact. So to start, I just wanted to um, give a, a brief overview on which is the context uh, in nutrients at European level. So at this point, uh, there's uh, during the last years, there, ha there, uh, there has been an increase in the demand of uh, mineral fertilizers of nitrogen and phosphorus. And this uh, goes together with a resource depletion to obtain these fertilizing products and uh, high energy cost associated to these fertilizing products that has uh, been uh, increased uh, due to the energetic crisis that we are uh, having now. And so this is the, the, the scenario no? on mineral fertilizers. And uh, what we also have is a lot of um, natrient sources no? that we have um, uh, available. And these natrient sources are causing currently uh, natrient imbalances among Europe. So there's uh, regions in Europe that have an excess of natrients and there are other uh, regions that have a, a lack of natrients. So we want to see if we can uh, somehow help on balancing these natrient imbalances and uh, recover natrients from uh, different uh, residual streams, not to close the natrient cy uh, cycles. And in fact, manure is uh, the, the most important uh, source of uh, uh, secondary source of nutrients. Uh, in Europe, more than 1,400 millions of tons of manure are produced every year. And these include uh, an important uh, amount of nitrogen and, and phosphorus that currently are not recovered. And more than 90% of this manure is directly returned to the, um, to the agricultural fields without any treatment. And this is, of course, causing some environmental problem and this excess of nutrients uh, in the soil. So we would need to see how we can uh, recover these nutrients from manure. So what we are doing in Ferti Manure is to consider these nutrients as, a, as an opportunity, no? And as an opportunity, for for the for different sectors and uh, here is uh, what I'm showing which benefits which solutions and which opportunities would this um, recovery of nutrients from animal manure could bring uh, to the different uh, sectors so for example in the case of the livestock uh, sector uh, this can be a new business opportunity for them because they could somehow sell the nutrients uh, contained in the manure that they are producing. So for the agricultural sector, we would like to produce uh, and uh, to, that they could have uh, new um, fertilizing products that can be safe to be used, that have the same agronomic quality that the current mineral fertilizers that they are using. For the chemical industry, and more specifically the fertilizing industry, it's a way to diversify the, their nutrient sources. So as I said, they are depending on finite sources to produce and that are coming out from Europe to produce their fertilizing products. And this would be a new source for them to produce their products. So also for the technology providers, because we would need to have like biorefineries and technologies to recover, to recover these nutrients from animal manure. It would also be a new opportunity for them. And then for the policy makers and, and the society, we highly believe that to, to be able to recover these uh, nutrients from secondary sources in the long term will uh, be crucial to ensure the food security and, and a sustainable agriculture. Um, and based on, on this uh, scenario, and okay, we have this uh, huge amount of nutrients that currently are not recovered, are not properly used, and we need these fertilizing products. So we built what we call the Fertimanure Circular Economy Strategy, and this is the one represented in this figure. Um, so mainly uh, what this Fertimanure is doing is, uh, as a first step, we are uh, treating the animal manure uh, with different technologies. And then 
with these technologies, what we are recovering bio-based fertilizers. We are recovering nutrients in a way that we have removed the um, pathogens, pollutants, and other impurities. So we are obtaining what we are calling bio-based fertilizers that can be used for two different purposes. On the one hand, these bio-based fertilizers can directly be used in the agricultural fields as a more um, adequate product than directly the manure or we can sell them as a primary um, sources to the fertilizing industry to produce tailor-made fertilizers. So we understand a tailor-made fertilizer as a um, fertilizing product that is matching a specific crop and soil requirements and that could have a more added value in the market. And then the third approach uh, is one uh, consisting in obtaining directly tailor-made fertilizers from animal manure. This is a process based on a patent that the company Fertinagro has, and they are uh, mixing manure with different additives to finally obtain tailor-made fertilizing products. Uh, so uh, in that sense, um, what we are doing in Fertimanure, it, so it's not only about technology, so we are not only focused on the technologies for nutrient recovery, but we will also try to help with our project to solve the regional and interregional nutrient imbalances um, due to the problem that I mentioned, that there's these regions with the excess of nutrients and other regions with the lack of nutrients. We are willing to demonstrate that our products have a good agronomic quality that can be high quality products, safe to be used, and that can compete in the, in the fertilizing products uh, market. Um, we will work on developing uh, business models, specifically targeting farmers and also the fertilizing industry. And we want, we want also to work to provide policy relevant information to policymakers to help on introducing these products to the, to the European market. So Fertimanure is about technology, it's about nutrient management, quality and safety assessment, business models, and also to be sure that our products can be accepted. So in the project, we have five different biorefineries in different countries with a high uh, livestock uh, density. Um, I cannot go into detail to these pilots, but if you want to see the technological approach of the biorefineries of our project, you can go to our website and you will find the infographics of the different biorefineries that we have. And you can also contact me if you want uh, more information about uh, our pilots. And with these five pilots, what we are uh, obtaining is a total of 18 bio-based fertilizing products. And with these products, what we are doing is a complete product characterization based on the parameters and the requirements set in the new fertilizing product regulation. We are doing a complete agronomic assessment um, in controlled conditions, but also uh, doing field trials of the products that we are producing. And we are comparing it with current fertilization strategies, with current mineral fertilizing products. And finally, what we are also doing is to do the sustainability assessment, to do the to evaluate the environmental impact of um, producing and applying these products, also the, the economic impact and the social impact. And then at the end, what uh, as I said at the beginning, we also have this approach of formulating tailor-made fertilizing products that we really think that it's uh, important if we want to have a, an impact in, in the market. Uh, so the main output of our project, so what we have done is to identify the main stakeholders that we have in our projects, and these are the six uh, stakeholder groups that I'm listing here in, in, in this figure. And, and what we want uh, to do is we have been talking with these uh, stakeholders groups, and we have uh, been uh, uh, tailoring a little bit the, the output of our projects to obtain useful tools, useful information for these stakeholders. So we didn't want only to produce deliverables or reports, but we wanted to see how our results can be useful for these, uh, for, um, these stakeholder groups. So I would say that the three most important ones are the um, agricultural producers, which includes also the, the livestock farmers, then the fertilizer industry, and also the, the policymakers. So for these uh, specific stakeholder groups, what are we going to produce? What are we working with? So on the one hand, we are producing um, a catalog of BBFs of all our products. 
Uh, this is uh, 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 an output for the fertilizing industry mainly, uh, and we want to present there in an easy and understandable way the relevant information about our products and how they are aligned with the regulation and their quality, their composition, uh, etc. Then uh, for the farmers, we are working on developing what we call the Ferti Manure Management Package. And in this case, we want to help farmers uh, on seeing how they can better manage their manure according to the region, according to the surrounding fields, according to the needs of nutrients of, of, of their region, according to the amount of manure that they are producing and how they are managing it. So for that, we, are, we have, um, well, we are working on creating uh, three different tools. One is the logistics tool. Then we have a decision support system and the TMF nutrition tool to formulate tailor-made fertilizers. And all these tools will be available at the end of the project and, uh, I mean, will available in our website. And then what we are also working with is uh, to be sure that the, the products that we are producing are attractive and are fitting the needs of our stakeholders. So in that sense, we are uh, doing different uh, sessions with the stakeholders, doing different surveys, and at this moment, we have collected more than 600 responses from different farmers, fertilizer producers, and stakeholders. We are aiming to increase this number of answers, but these are examples no, of questions that we are making them. And we are then evaluating which are uh, uh, their main concerns, which uh, things that they are um, the main barriers for them. And with this, it helps us to better focus uh, our products, to know in which products we should put more uh, importance. And, and we are also working in, in this way. And it will also help us to better develop the business models uh, that we are um, developing. And then uh, to finish, so we are also seeing how we can have some impact at, at policy level. And in that sense, uh, the key uh, regulation for us is the new fertilizing product regulation. So we would like to see at the end of the project, if at least some of our products, it will not be the 18 BDFs, but at least some of them could uh, potentially be C marked products. So in that sense, we are seeing how our products can uh, fit in uh, CMC and also in PFC. And we are also aware of the different um, uh, calls that the, the, the commission is, I mean, different um, questionnaires that the commission is uh, asking uh, for feedback. So we are uh, pen, um, aware on that and we are trying to provide all the information that, that we can. And also an important point for us, uh, and it, this one will not be easy, is to see if our products could be potentially accepted for organic farming or at least some of them. So we know that, um, yes, so that the, the livestock sector is, uh, as I said, is the most important uh, secondary source of, of nutrients uh, uh, through the, the manure. And the scenario at this moment is that, uh, that more than 70% of the animals are uh, in, in large farms. And in some regions, it, this number is increased until 90%. So uh, if we see this scenario of the livestock sector and the manure produced, and then we go to the other side and look at the organic farming uh, targets and limitations. So we know that uh, the new farm to fork strategy has set the objective not to reach the 25% of organic farming in 2030, um, but uh, they are uh, using uh, nutrients to uh, not, I mean, they, they need also nutrients in the organic farming sector, but they currently don't accept nutrients coming from factory farming. So in that sense, we would like to provide information, relevant information uh, of fertility manure products, because we really, we really think, we highly believe that our philosophy, uh, the philosophy of our project fits well with the philosophy of organic farming, and that our products could be of uh, perfectly uh, perfect quality for, for the organic farming. So we are also working in, in this line uh, in terms of uh, policy. And yeah, very briefly and very quick, uh, that's all from my side. I will be happy to answer any questions or if you want to send me an email for more specific information about the pilots or our products, I will be happy to do that. Thank you, Laia, for the very interesting presentation. We already have some hand rate for the questions, but before that, we will head to the 
quick poll to engage all of that in these now, and then we will uh, gather your questions and, and seek answers in, uh, um, from our speakers. So let's head straight to our poll. Please answer those three quick questions just to facilitate the discussion afterwards. You have the poll right now, I hope. Can you see the poll? I can. Okay, can I ask you to answer the poll? Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, the majority of you have already answered, but I see that uh, the answers are still coming in. So let's wait a minute more. Okay, thank you very much for the poll. And let me show you the answers of what you have voted for. Do you think that the cooperative business model can boost the creation of value chains around the circular bioeconomy? Most of you chose the yes, without a doubt. And some of you, 38%, choose yes, but cooperative must be open to joining forces with other stakeholders. Can I ask uh, Susanna Rivera to comment on the on the poll it's probably a positive sign for you right for cooperatives uh, around europe of course in my, from my side since uh, I, I i am working with cooperatives in a very close way uh, i am convinced that the cooperation is the is the way of of or of being in front of the bioeconomy uh, so but in any case we would need to, to reinforce our, our collaboration way uh, with other stakeholders because, in fact, uh, we are going to provide the raw materials for the, for the, for the value chains, providing these, these, these starting points from the value chains. But we should work together with other exper experience, experienced uh, partners to, to, to improve the valorization of our waste. So, I am convinced of, the, of this, yeah. this, of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much uh, for the comment. And now heading to the second question. Do you think primary producers are aware of their leading role in the circular bioeconomy? Uh, most of you answer yes, but we need to support them in order to make them more visible to society. And this is something that we are actually doing right now. And thanks also to your participation. But uh, if may I ask a comment from uh, from Maite Aldaya, also uh, in in view of the Beef Plus project and other projects with with primary producers. Well, I, I have to say, uh, uh, well, that the, for example, the beef project um, deals with the use of byproducts, that this has al always been done here in Spain, that we have kind of circular economy in the farms, that the, you farm the crops and the crops um, waste, you use them, you generally use them for the, for the uh, feeding the, the animals. 
I think that it has been the modernization of agriculture, which has created these kind of problems that ex excess of the intensification no, of agriculture uh, with the excess of, of nutrients and, and, and ways that you cannot manage. And then we need to find a solution for, for, for this. But uh, yes, I think they are aware, like the primary producers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. And the last question, what obstacles do you think hinder the implementation of good practices in the circular bioeconomy? Uh, well, here we have a rather split answers, but the regulatory um, barriers are first, then the market barriers, and lack of public economic incentives. Um, Armin Winter, could you comment on this one? Do you also find it find that regulatory obstacles are the 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 main barriers for a circular bioeconomy? Yes, um, I think this this uh, shows very good the problems we have there, uh, especially that we have these three topics also the the pretty the same. So regulatory we also have often in using waste material. So like I said, when we call it already waste, so especially I know it in Austria that we have some problems, how to treat them, then it gets a little bit more complicated to get back into the value chain again. This has then also often related to the, to the market barrier properties. So to work together with, with, with producers, with, with transformers, like part of paper industry or something like this. So you really have to work with the very properly, convince them, and they are not so eager to take new waste materials into their productive steps. And so this is also some, some good, uh, good thinking about it. And I can agree on this. So regulatory market barrier and cheese is a big issue to transform new value, to, to, to facilitate the value chain. Thank you very much. And now it's time for the questions from the audience. You can use the Q and A uh, option uh, in the Zoom um, desktop account, or you can raise your hand, and then I'll um, enable you to to um, ask your question. So we have we had some hands raised before from Philippe de Prince, I think. Is that right? Yes, I had a, a question um, regarding the, the final uh, results of, uh, of the project of uh, the manure project, Fertie Manure. When do we expect uh, some results of it? Yes, so we are, uh, the project will finish uh, uh, end of 2023, maybe early 2024. But yeah, I would say that during 2023, we will already be uh, able to, to show some results and to, to start, uh, yeah, because since now we have been mainly promoting um, our pilots, uh, we have uh, done some events uh, to present specifically, specifically how the pilot uh, pilots works. We also have the results of the first set of um, field trials. But in terms, for example, of sustainability assessment or business or the tools that I mentioned, we are working on it now. So yeah, I would say during 2023, we will already start having uh, relevant results to, to share. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? You can also write them in the question uh, and ask your option on Zoom. Mm, okay, I do not see any more questions. Uh, so probably uh, this is the end of our circular talk today, but don't uh, leave yet because we will have a, a discussion also after the circular talk using uh, the spatial chat function. Now my uh, colleague from the uh, stakeholder platform ha uh, has used the chat to uh, give you the link to the spatial chat. 
please enter the chat. And if you have uh, an option to discard uh, circular bioeconomy and the, the necessary value chain um, adaptations necessary to, to implement circularity, please join us in the chat. And uh, now I would like to thank you all for joining us in the circular talk. And uh, hopefully we will see each other soon to advance circularity together once again. Thank you very much. See you on the spatial chat. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.